exercise of emergency powers has, has saved countless lives and has brought us the ICU capacity to be prepared for the surge that may be coming this summer or potentially this fall. There are still a number of things that the governor has to move quickly on in his administration, and the legislature cannot move and has not moved that quickly. Um, when the legislature doesn't get along, it further uh, demonstrates the reason that ex use of executive authority is appropriate at this moment in time. The, both the pandemic and the murder of, of George Floyd have really laid bare the deeply rooted inequalities in our communities. And this is a time where we have to take seriously the thousands of Minnesotans who came out into the streets and, and demanded justice for George and demanded that we make changes to um, a police system that's broken in certain respects and is fundamentally a racist design that we have to, to systemically change in order to make a difference. It would be very easy to come in and pass the least controversial police reform uh, bills, uh, banning chokeholds, um, a duty to intervene, which is already the policy in 81 of 87 counties. But in order for us to answer the, the pleas of Minnesotans, we need to really dig into this work and we really need to do something meaningful that will lead to lasting and systemic change. Uh, the Minnesota House of Representatives is ready to do that work. Uh, we could not have a better leader in our chair of the uh, Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee, uh, Carlos Mariani and his incredible staff, and also the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus. You know, their lived experiences and their voices are crafting uh, the policy here and leading our caucus. Uh, they have a different lived experience than we do, and this is an important moment for us to listen and then follow the lead. So with that, I will turn it over to Majority Leader Winkler. Good morning. Minnesotans expect and deserve action on police accountability, racial justice, economic support, and COVID-19 legislation. Minnesotans are asking us to meet this moment and move quickly. More and more Minnesotans are desperate for help, and the legislature has an opportunity to partner with each other, with the Walls administration, to deliver results, but we cannot wait. So far, Republican attempts to divide Minnesotans and blame others uh, rather than recognizing that we all have a role in this situation has been reckless. Uh, this is the most demanding time Minnesota has faced uh, in its history. At least no other time has been more demanding than this. I frankly am concerned that we have seen uh, so much outrage over the acts of desperation of people who have living, been living with systemic racism, who have been living with deep inequality for so long than we are over the fact that we have those inequalities that we have systemic racism holding people back and that it culminated in the murder of George Floyd. If the legislature and Republicans truly want to play a role in governing during this crisis, they have an opportunity to do so with us. We can join together and deliver on these, on deliver on these needs and make sure that Minnesota is meeting this moment. But if the legislature cannot act together, then we are removing our authority and our ability to make a difference to meet the moment and to govern in a crisis. The question for the legislature is whether it is ready to act. The people who will gather outside the Capitol demand action and we should be the ones who are providing it or we will expect more unrest, more inequity and a society that is not able to live up to its promise. We have to deliver now. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Senator Kent. Thank you, Representative Winkler. Good morning, everyone. Today we are headed into special session with a commitment to do our part to be productive and effective and to do good work that will benefit the people of Minnesota. There are a few things that we need to do right away and that includes passing legislation that makes our criminal justice system more fair and just, passing a robust bonding bill that will help rebuild and revitalize communities statewide and provide badly needed jobs during this recession extending the governor's emergency power so he can continue to respond and act swiftly to the continuously changing circumstances associated with the COVID-19 pandemic and keep Minnesotans safe. There are also other things that we expect to take up such as additional small business grants and CARES Act funding for local governments, housing assistance and broadband, including distance learning. The four leaders have been meeting to talk about these issues over the past couple of weeks, and we hope these conversations will turn into swift action this special session. 
I also want to express my very clear and specific hope that the positive messages will be followed up with meaningful action. As we've all been taught, actions speak louder than words. We have heard Senate Republicans tell us they want a strong bonding bill, but you may recall that during regular session, they didn't release their bonding proposal until the day before we adjourned. It was flawed and unable to garner the necessary support to pass. And here we are on the first day of special session. And again, there has been very little response from Senate Republicans to our outreach on the specifics of their bill this, at, at this time. As our lead Senator Sandy Pappas has said repeatedly, this is a pattern over several years. And the DFL, Senate DFL stands ready at any minute to work with them to get a good bill for Minnesota. In addition, we have been encouraged to hear that the Senate Republicans have reversed their earlier resistance to addressing criminal justice reform with any sense of urgency. And it's my understanding that they are introducing a handful of bills. I have heard um, from their, the, the past media availability that they just did that um, a lot of these are pretty um, uh, basic things that have been implemented throughout our communities already and do not sound like they are going to be meaningful change. Um, I have strongly encouraged Senator Gazelka that they should work with our caucus and our members, particularly our members of the Posse Caucus who have been working on these issues for years. That is the way forward for meaningful changes in policing and criminal justice. As we go to the Senate floor today, we should come together in good faith with a willingness to put partisanship aside and truly work together. We have a public health emergency, a major recession, and a major historic event in racial equity and justice. In this moment, we should keep our promises to each other and to the people of Minnesota. And with that, I will pass it over to Senator Jeff Hayden. Good, well, thank you, um, uh, Senator Kent and esteemed leaders uh, in the House. Um, I won't add much more uh, onto this other than to say, uh, that I am really disappointed in listening uh, and watching uh, what the Senate, uh, the Senate Republicans um, had decided to do on criminal justice and law reform. Uh, they, many of them have been uh, in the district, a district that George Floyd died, uh, many of you know, is just eight blocks from my house. Uh, the three fourths of the devastation on Lake Street is in my district. Uh, they have been there, they've seen it, they've wept, uh, they've expressed that uh, they want to do something better. But as usual, when the time comes, they come with flimsy, lighthearted, not uh, very serious proposals on criminal justice reform. I want to applaud, as a member of the Pocky Caucus, of original member, I want to applaud my colleagues in the House who have taken a serious look at this, a comprehensive look. There is eight hours worth of testimony and, and bill review that will go on tomorrow to let all Minnesotans in, those that are victims, those that are on the other side, but we're taking a serious look at that. And today we get five small bills without real clarity. And I will say this, Senator Warren Limmer has not talked to me one time. To, to my knowledge, he hasn't talked to anybody in our committee to work on these issues. I can't say if he's talked to anybody in the House but he certainly hasn't talked to his colleagues in the Senate. So um, I feel that this is disingenuous. Uh, I feel that this is not uh, what Minnesotans of all persuasions were asking us to do. And I have to tell you that I've been to the site almost every day. I've been on Lake Street almost every day. And not all people there are African-American or Black people, though they are the ones that disproportionately feel the pain of this issue of, of police brutality and police misconduct, there are plenty, a plenty of Minnesotans who aren't black that have called me and talked to me and said they want this change. So I'm not sure what the constituency they're trying to hold, uh, but it is not working. And we are going to demand and continue to demand and people are gonna to continue to demand that we change these policies, that we do fundamental transformational change and the way that law enforcement is managed in the state and the way that they treat people of color, in particular black people. I'll leave you with the great civil rights icon, Fannie Lou Hamer, who says, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So thank you. Okay, our first question or request to ask question is Bill Werner. Um, Madam Speaker and Mr. Majority Leader, um, talking about Majority Leader Winkler, um, 
can you uh, do you agree with what Senator Hayden just said about that? Uh, what uh, Senate Republicans are bringing forward is, is flimsy and a lighthearted proposal. If so, what needs to be in that as far as you are concerned? And how do you get that done? Because they say they're going to be out of here a week from today. Well, I can't speak to what they have put out because they just put it out this morning and didn't share it with us ahead of time. But what I can say is that uh, we should not be in any hurry to leave the state capitol before our work is done. The people of Minnesota have demanded that we take action. This task is in front of us. The work is in front of us. Just because it's hard, just because it's time consuming, doesn't mean that we have any excuse not to do it and not to do it correctly. The most important thing is to listen to the voices of the people who are most affected by police brutality. Um, Senator Hayden, uh, I I can't say it better than Senator Hayden did, that there are uh, people in the community whose voices need to be heard. And to to Chair Mariani's credit, yes, he has scheduled an eight-hour hearing. Is eight hours enough? Probably not enough. No. I mean, did we really need to have the murder of George Floyd? Shouldn't Philando Castile's death have been enough for us to change policing practices or any number of victims before that? So the time is now. Uh, Minnesotans and people all over the world reacted to George Floyd's brutal murder over eight minutes and 46 seconds on video and demanded action. And so for the Republicans to abandon post and go home because uh, they think it's too hard uh, would be ignoring the task that Minnesotans have put on our plate. And I would add that the uh, Criminal Justice uh, Reform Committee in the Minnesota House has been working on this since that committee started uh, in 2019. Um, so as soon as we had the ability to start moving legislation, Chair Mariani and that committee worked with Republicans in the House. They worked with law enforcement. They tried to create a bipartisan bill last year that had substantial criminal justice reform elements in it and got nowhere with uh, Senator Limmer. Uh, And so, yes, I think it's entirely accurate to say that this is a lazy and last minute approach to a problem that has been with us for a long time and we have been working on for a long time. The proposals that we are bringing forward are based on the, uh, in part on the Ellison Harrington report that came out. That's been uh, underway for some time. It included a very broad mix of people and groups uh, weighing in. We are consulting with the community. Uh, This is something that has been building for a long time and the A moment to actually move legislation and engage is now. But to think that you can come out at the last minute with a fairly weak proposal uh, and say that we're going to do a little bit of work for a week and then go home is not what this moment requires. And it is time for them to step up and do the right thing and take action. I just want to be want to be clear. What makes this week? What is missing from this that you see? And I know that you folks have just gotten a real quick look at it as we have. But but where are the are the uh, alarm bells going off that this is not going to do the job uh, as far as you folks are concerned? You know, I, I can't speak to the specific proposals again because I haven't seen them. What I can speak to is the desire to cut and run on Minnesotans at this moment. Um, this is hard. Uh, to change things in a way that matters will take some time, and it will definitely take listening to the people who are most affected. So, um, you know, a, a typical um, white male patriarchy system, you have a white guy charge to the front and say, this is the plan, this is how we're going to do it, let's go. Um, you know what, it might be time to make space for voices of people of color who have a different lived experience. It might be time to actually listen to Representative Rena Moran when she talks about her lived experience and her son's lived experience and her daughter's lived experience, and then reflect on that. And as a human being, let yourself be changed by it and come to the work with a different spirit and different attitude. But to say, we're gonna come in, we're gonna charge ahead, we're gonna get these things done without having listened to the community uh, because we're in some big hurry because it's a special session, um, that that isn't the approach to take. The approach to take is to truly listen and to take the time that it that it needs. Minnesotans pay us all year round, and it might not be convenient to come to work in June, but the work is in front of us. So let's stay here. Let's listen to each other. Let's open our hearts and let's do what we need to do, not in a hurry. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Mr. Leader. Okay, next question is from Tori Van Oot. Hi, um, Senator Kazilka talked about 
thinking that it might be possible to get a bonding bill up to 1.35 billion done in the next week. Um, do you think that's doable? Are you willing to do the bonding bill without agreement on some of this broader criminal justice reform? Um, you know, it seems they could just adjourn and then what can you do if, if they leave, right? Right, that's a good point. Um, I think that be, we should not have the attitude that we can't do anything until we can do everything. I think that the bonding bill is a major piece of unfinished business from the regular session. Um, if we could address uh, Representative Doubt's concerns about emergency authority, obviously we're not going to lift the governor's authority, um, but if we could address his concerns about governor's executive authority um, and some of his concerns about the deficit, I think we, we should be able to have a deal that could move, over, move forward on bonding. Our bonding uh, folks have been working together, but I will say, um, you know, that uh, Senator Senjum has not engaged in the kind of bipartisan work that needs to happen for us to complete a bonding bill. And um, uh, Minority Leader Kent and Senator Hayden can speak to that. Unless we just lost. Well, yeah, I, I certainly can. I was, was looking for uh, Senator Kent. So um, I, I guess what I would say is um, that we, and I've said this a lot, that we are looking for significant uh, law enforcement reform and certainly uh, to be engaged. And I think the uh, speaker said it best about lived experience. Well, I'm an African-American black man living in the community in which George uh, uh, was killed, uh, Mr. Floyd was killed. And so I think it would be just prudent to have a conversation with us to talk about what are the things that we want and not just assume that you already know. Uh, that That assumption has got us into this situation uh, where we are today. So we certainly, in the community that uh, I represent in all over Minnesota, want this to happen. And we certainly would like, to, oops, sorry about that. We certainly would, would like to see that um, happen. Uh, but just on, and I'll let uh, Leader Kent talk about uh, just Senator Sinjins. Uh, he hasn't done significant bipartisan work or across, uh, uh, across in the House. He hasn't done good work uh, inside the Senate. He hasn't had the conversations with us um, with uh, Senator Pappas to even start to have us get on board, much less than have that conversation with the leaders in the House. So I, I, I think he's been derelict and negligent in his duty, uh, but much less we do and are looking for some significant reform in the law enforcement and criminal justice community uh, as we move forward to a, a bonding bill or an infrastructure bill, which of course uh, I would like to see as well because of the devastation in my district. And I will just briefly address the bonding side of this because this is exactly what we saw happen at the end of regular session. It's not just a number. This is a lot of money that means a lot to our communities and our state and to people who need these jobs um, to, to do these projects. Um, and where those projects are and what kinds of projects are included and the mix of them, are they geographically representative of the entire state? Um, are they taking care of our um, higher education facilities and our critical infrastructure? Um, those are important details. And I find it just sort of mind boggling that someone would think it's okay to put together over a billion dollars worth of spending proposal and show it to you and expect you to pass it an hour later. It, it, and, and we have reached out over and over and over again to try to have that conversation. And we're willing to work with them. We know what their priorities are. We're willing to find that common ground. Um, but I don't know how you do this if you, don't, if you won't actually discuss the details. It's not just the number. Okay, next question is from Kevin Featherly. Kevin, if you want to unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, is there any chance that the House would accept just the five police proposals, and I don't know precisely what those are, but that the Senate says is running, it's willing to run with for the special session. One of those that they did say they'd go with is the use of force doctrine rewrite, which the governor suggested is a key um, necessity for the special session. Well, I think it would be premature for us to say what uh, we can agree with Senate Republicans on when we haven't had the time to review what they're proposing. In our caucus, uh, Chair Mariani and the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus are leading here. And I think that um, the key point I would make is we need to have engagement and conversation and not be in a hurry. Let's do it right instead of doing it fast. It, it, the other thing I would just add is our proposal is comprehensive. We don't just take one little piece out and think that that will uh, be sufficient. Uh, we're trying to look systemically at how uh, the 
policing in Minnesota could lead to the murder of George Floyd. And frankly, um, uh, it is a whole system that makes that possible, not just one person. And so we need to look comprehensively. And so I think it is premature for us to say that one piece or five pieces will be sufficient to address this. Uh, frankly, it's going to take much more than just this summer to continue to do this work, but we should try to accomplish as much as we possibly can because the moment calls for it. A compromise is possible well, along that front? Well, well, if I may add, the other thing that I heard Senator Gazelka when I peeped in was he, he had no intention of conferring the bills. He had no one, he was just going to send them to the House and they take it or leave it. Um, I mean, he said that. You would do not ask him the question. And so, therefore, I, I'm not quite sure uh, how we legislate in the context of they passing five bills, regardless to if we found some agreement or not, but not have any conversation uh, with the House uh, to talk about what else we could do or uh, how they could negotiate and find agreement. It doesn't sound like they're looking for that. Okay, we all have to wrap at about 11.20, so we'll try to get through uh, questions quick here. Ricardo Lopez is next. Hey, um, my question is short. Um, what happens if the Senate adjourns on Friday and it is indeed a one special or one week special session without uh, the adoption of proposals that are being led by the DFL um, and the Posse Caucus? What happens if, if they adjourn next Friday? Well, if they adjourn, um, it does kind of force an adjournment signee die on us as well. Uh, we can hang around, but there's not a lot of point to it when you um, pass bills uh, to a Senate that's not in session. It's kind of like screaming into the abyss. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so um, just as um, Chair Mariani and people of color and Indigenous Caucus have been working really uh, tirelessly since uh, May 26th, uh, I would imagine that that work will continue and we will uh, continue to reach out to people um, to, to make the uh, bills better. Most of the outreach so far has been within the Democratic Caucus and within affected communities. There hasn't been a lot of uh, outreach on our end either to Republicans yet. We're just at the beginning of that. So I would expect that that work will continue whether we are in session or not. And as long as the governor's executive authority persists, we'll be back on, on July 12th and potentially August 12th and potentially September 12th. So there are other moments where we have perhaps a forced check-in, but we also have the possibility that the governor can call us into special session to pass legislation as soon as there's an agreement. So we would not relent in our commitment to doing this work, whether the Senate uh, Republicans um, adjourn prematurely or not. Thank you. Okay, next question from Mara Gottfried with the Pioneer Press. Um, question, question about the bill uh, that would change police use of uh, deadly force law. What effects would you expect the changes to have? Slash, what are the aims with the changes? Have modifications of this type been proposed before to this statute? That is a question for Chair Mariani and the proponents of, of that bill. I think we, we all have seen on uh, numerous recorded citizen video of problems with use of force, but the experts on uh, what precisely needs to change in the law to make a difference are the folks that are working in that area, Chair Mariani and the members of the, uh, his committee. All right, Bill Werner, uh, isn't all this talk about a bonding bill just just wishful thinking because House Minority Leader Doubt has basically reiterated no bonding bill unless the governor relinquishes his emergency powers? Uh, no, my understanding is that um, Representative Doubt is concerned about the governor's emergency powers, and it may be uh, that he has drawn a line in the sand that he's sticking to, but um, my understanding is that he has indicated to uh, folks in the construction industry that he would like to find a way to get a bill done. And so I'm hopeful that we could maybe address some aspects of the governor's use of executive power that could satisfy his concerns enough to get a bill to move forward. The other possibility is that there are six Republicans who think that that is a line in the sand that um, doesn't make a lot of sense and who would prefer to have a bonding bill uh, to an argument to take to the election. Okay, with that, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat and we're pretty much out of time anyway. So we'll wrap there.